um, if I started the webinar, that would be the end of the series, and then everybody would have to re-register again. So anyway, I extended it. Apologize. Hopefully nobody has any problems with next week's. All right. Welcome to the January 2nd edition of the Fats, Fuels, and Oils webinar. I hope everybody had a wonderful break. Um, I did, and that'll be reflected in today's webinar a little bit, uh, which will cover what's happened in South American weather over the last couple of weeks. And then we'll talk about the U.S. Uh, domestic soybean market um, and talk a little bit about crushing volumes and uh, more about exports and then the relative, well, relative crush margins for the U.S., China, and, and Argentina, and a bit about what's going on with, uh, with Chinese soybean demand, particularly for uh, U.S. imports. All right, let me actually share my screen. Okay. So um, you can see in Argentina that there's been some continued improvement in uh, in rainfall over the last couple of weeks, and it looks like well, not a lot of rain every day. Certainly, there's forecast for rain every day. Temperatures about normal, maybe a little above normal, um, but not enough that any of this is a big concern. I think that uh, expectations for Argentina's crop are still reasonably around 50 million tons or just a little bit below 50 million tons. And although... Although rainfall had started the season a little more spotty than they probably would have liked it, it does seem like the uh, the trend change that we talked about in the last webinar is is taking hold and it's beginning to look more like a typical South American summer where both Argentina and Brazil get sufficient rainfall and and produce big crops. And I think that um, that shift back to sort of normal weather is going to be really important for uh, for obvious reasons, but also I think it's going to be really important in the longer term. So if we're shifting back to a regime where South American crops, we don't really worry about drought or we're not trying to pick how small we are, they are, we're trying to pick how big they are, um, if that's what we're headed back into, then it's going to be really hard for prices to rally that much. And the pressure on soybean prices will will pressure soybean oil prices, and, and those are considerably below 50 cents this morning. And I think that given what, given the amount of, well, just given soybean oil's fundamentals, if soybean oil is is at 47 now, then it probably takes out the upper end of the fair value range. So if before we were sort of five cents around around uh, 55, so 50 to 60, now I would say we're probably five cents around uh, 50 cents. Now there are some things that will work on that are there are some things that are probably keeping prices a little bit lower than they otherwise would be right now, including uh, strong meal demand and, and uh, oil share spreading uh, by the funds. So that'll depress them, uh, that is depressing prices a little bit more, um, but still it's, it's hard to argue that uh, as Brazilian weather improves, soybean prices probably will continue to uh, move lower, or as I think I said Brazilian, as South American weather improves. Uh, for Brazil, it's kind of, there hasn't been as much rain as is normal quite yet, um, but you can see from the forecast for the rain that there's plenty of rain in the forecast. And if that verifies, that should be normal or, or a little bit above normal. And then temperatures look like uh, they're going to move into the lower end of the historical range, which is almost the opposite of, of what 
of the weather in the center west growing region uh, has been earlier in the season and again suggests that there is a a change in the trend that ultimately will also maybe support uh, Brazilian corn acreage, although some of the soybeans were planted so late that farmers said that they were going to give up on on uh, planting corn. And in some cases, that meant that they were going to switch to cotton or, or something else as a second crop. Uh, it's easy to say that when the weather looks crappy and you planted your, you just finished planting your soybeans two weeks late. If the weather improves, it may be that some of that acreage that uh, that farmers say they aren't going to plant won't or will get planted with corn. And that'll be important because uh, Brazil's second crop is typically the crop that they export. And to the extent that uh, that U.S. exports are reduced by Brazilian shipments, then that an increase in Brazilian production will reduce the export demand out of the U.S., ultimately potentially reducing the need for U.S. acres, allowing an increase in soybean acres and uh, weighing on soybean oil prices potentially even more, I suppose, if if we get a huge increase in U.S. Uh, soybean acres this next uh, spring, in a couple months here, actually. Um, all right, so on to uh, the U.S. And, and what I wanted to talk about today was a bit about uh, so U.S. soybean exports and this idea that, um, you know, basically you can export or you can crush soybeans. And so if we're exporting them, we're not crushing them. Um, you can see that uh, that shipments so far this year have been well below um, where they were last year and have fallen below the um, the five-year average. And that is despite sort of a, a stronger than expected, I guess, or at least stronger than expected by me, start to the marketing year. So in September, we exported like, uh, I think maybe 70 million bushels roughly of soybeans, if I'm remembering correctly. And then in uh, October, we exported about 350 million bushels. The 70 million is is roughly in line with what you would expect seasonally. Uh, and the 350 is, is also not super far out of line for what you would expect seasonally, which is a little surprising given that US soybean stocks are relatively tight and um, and U.S. crush margins are, if not historically high anymore, at, at least are in the upper end of, of the historical range or remain in the upper end of, of the historical range. And so crushing should be relatively competitive. Export demand mostly comes down to how competitive the U.S. is, which is not very, um, and then how profitable crushing is in importing countries, primarily in um, in China. And for China, we had seen a, um, we saw early in the marketing year, a big exports that were higher than we normally would see, and, and therefore certainly much higher than expected. But then we got a much sharper drop off in, in shipments to China uh, over the last two months. Um, and that probably is is much more reflective of U.S. competitiveness and also a bit of uh, what's gone on with Chinese crush margins, which were starting to recover and, and have come worked their way back lower here recently. Uh, we expect that, uh, that U.S. exports are going to remain under pressure this year and don't think that we're probably going to, uh, it, I think we're at one seven maybe. And, and I was kind of, I had to be sort of dragged screaming and kicking into, into one seven, uh, on us exports for 23, 24, 1.7 billion bushels. Sorry. Um, and so there are soybeans to export a little bit more, but given the strength of crush that we've seen, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if, if and how 
uncompetitive the U.S. is, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me if exports ultimately ended up below the R17 forecast. If you look at shipments last summer, U.S. shipped maybe 100 million soybean, 100 million bushels of soybeans uh, over last summer, which is, you know, in a lot of years, we would ship 100 million bushels in a month during the summer. So we expect one, we expect the summer to be like that, especially if if you get, you know, 210 million tons of soybeans out of out of uh, Brazil and Argentina. Um, and and again, probably expect that that uh, the export number will be a little bit lower. Whether that goes to stocks or to to crush will kind of depend a little bit on on where crush margins end up. There certainly is demand for the products for soybeans, so I wouldn't necessarily expect that uh, that we would see a big slowdown in in crush during this year relative to the seasonal pace. We'll certainly see the typical kind of seasonal decrease that we see, um, but it wouldn't expect me if if the uh, if the seasonal decrease wasn't a little bit smaller in crush this year, just because, uh, just because U.S. exports aren't that competitive and uh, and there there's really good demand for the products. Uh, so this is just um, import prices into China, and this shows how truly uncompetitive the U.S. is into China. Um, if you look in at the uh, the details of the Chinese market, you can also find that um, that U.S. soybeans are are uncompetitive relative to uh, to Brazil and Argentina. They're a little bit more competitive with uh, domestically produced soybeans, although domestically produced soybeans are still uh, still just a little bit more expensive, I think, than uh, than U.S. soybeans at at this point. Um, and there's basically about a thirty dollar a ton difference between the average of of uh, Chinese imported soybean prices and the average or Chinese imported soybean prices at the Dalian port versus domestically produced uh, Chinese soybeans at the Dalian port. So. You can see just from a competitive perspective that China's dem import demand will continue, and that's not uh, that's not surprising or that's not news. China produces not that many soybeans, call it twenty million tons or something, and um, and they import a hundred million tons. So the twenty million tons may be off by a bit, but it's you know they import four to five times as many soybeans as they. Is they produce and uh, and they need all of those for crushing. So, the fact that um, domestically produced soybeans are are more expensive than imported is is not necessarily uh, surprising. However, it does sort of speak to um, the the con ongoing need to for China to continue to import soybeans. And at this time of the year, you know, we're before the Brazilian crop or before the Argentinian crop, or we're just barely, barely maybe getting close to Brazilian harvest. Um, and so it's it's kind of if China's not buying from the US, they're essentially not buying from anybody. And I talked about they bought some from some uh from South Africa, but South Africa is also on a, a southern hemisphere growing season. So this isn't the time of the year that they typically have a lot of extra soybeans that, they, uh, that they're trying to export. Um, so it seems likely that in the short term, what you're gonna get is more pressure on Chinese crush margins. So you can see we had a big recovery in the summer and then crush margins kind of peaked with harvest and then have, have come down and this compares margins for uh, domestically pro uh, domestically produced soybeans and, and imported soybeans. You can see domestically produced soybeans are are extraordinarily negative, uh, and the crush margins for domestically produced soybeans and the crush margins for uh, for imported soybeans are only marginally negative. So, on average, about ten dollars a ton of negative margin in China for uh, imported soybean crushing. 
Now that compares with um, 209 a bushel in the U.S., uh, including the premium for uh, refining the soybean oil. If you don't refine the soybean oil, that takes about 60 cents out, a little bit more than 60 cents, so a little bit below $1.50. Um, if you look at the board crush, well, th these are cash margins, so these are a little bit higher. If you look at the board crush and you look at the long-term average of the board crush, it's, it's around 90 cents. So again, it, given that there's a little bit extra premium in, in cash margins for basis and stuff, um, these are probably, the current crush margins are, are fairly in line with the long-term average in the U.S., in Argentina, it's it's less than a dollar a bushel, and that is contributing to Argentina's lack of competitive competitiveness relative to Brazil uh, in both soybeans and in soybean oil and in soybean meal. Joao has talked a couple of times about how um, how Argentinian soybean oil exports have lost share to Brazil over the last couple of years, but this this past year in particular, because the the drought was so tough on Argentinian crops. And that's probably going to continue until the next harvest. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens in Argentina, given the new president and his uh, his approach to economic policy whether he he very uh, he's a big believer in free markets. And so the soy dollar programs that the government has used in the past, um, whether they'll continue or not, on on one hand, they need the the products to be exported so that they can get foreign reserves. On the other hand, uh, setting an artificially high exchange rate isn't exactly free market policy. So whether those are continue or not in, in exactly what, if any changes come to the Argentinian uh, agricultural policy sort of remain to be seen. One of the things that they're going to do is they're going to raise uh, the export tax on, ooh, I think it's, I, I think it's uh, soybean products. So I, I think it's soybean meal and soybean oil, raise those so that they're up equal to, um, equal to soybeans. So from 30% uh, to 33%, I think. Um, they may if if they continue to do if if that's the one and and I I pause because I remember seeing the article and I'm I'm relatively sure that's what it was but it might have been something else it might have been ethanol and corn or something but I think it was I think it was soybean um, if they do that one of the cornerstones of the U.S. anti-dumping uh, case for Argentinian biodiesel was their export tax structure. So the fact that as you go down the value chain, Argentinian export uh, taxes get lower. So the taxes for meal and oil are were lower, lower than soybeans and then for biodiesel lower than those. And so the, what the court found was that was a, a subsidy to the biodiesel industry. And so if Argentina is aligning their export taxes, it may be for a return to the um, to the biofuel market in the U.S. And given the the fact that there's going to be a limit on the credit value generated under the IRA credits for Argentine imports relative to um relative to the blender's tax credit, it may be that they're they're trying to get it set up so they can do it within the year. That doesn't seem likely to me because I think they would have to have the tariff, I think they would have to make the changes and then I think they'd have to go back in front of the World Trade Organization and make their case. And that doesn't sound like something that takes a year. Um, so 
it may be that he just is trying to generate more foreign exchange revenue and that's why he raised the taxes it may not be the part of a part of a larger plan to to export uh, argentinian biodiesel however if if the crop recovers and brazil is is also raising their uh, biomass based diesel mandate more than expected because they have produced more biodiesel than uh, the the current mandate and or they've consumed as much or a little bit more biodiesel than the current mandate and so raising it uh, up to 14 cent or 14 percent a little bit earlier made a lot of sense that potentially could be another export market for Argentinian biodiesel um, and so again it may be that they're not doing that to uh, to straighten out their tax structure so they can ship biodiesel to the U.S. It may just be that they're doing it for foreign exchange uh, reserves. Either way, I would expect that the Argentinian crush margins will probably expand out uh, after the new crop is harvested, although the demand from biodiesel producers in the export market, uh, particularly if the margin be, or the the spread between the U.S. and Argentinian soybean oil prices remains uh, as wide as it has, then there's some incentive for uh, U.S. biodiesel producers or biomass-based diesel producers to import Argentinian soybean oil and turn that into, um, turn that into biodiesel uh, for, the, um, for the domestic market there. Um, looking forward uh, on on Chinese crush margins, China has struggled to uh, struggled to transform their um, their hog industry in part because they've had a couple of bouts of of African swine fever. The first one was three or four years ago at this point, probably and was a really severe uh, outbreak and Chinese officials had to cull 40% of the herd. And just as they were getting back from that, or just as everybody sort of expected them to get back from that, then they had another much more contained outbreak, but, but still an outbreak uh, that has, has slowed the transition, I think, a bit. Probably another thing that's that's also slowing it, although the last uh, data for pork prices that I saw in China suggest that pork prices are are still really high, so the demand must be strong. But Chinese the Chinese economy has also been a bit weaker than everybody anticipated, particularly coming out of their efforts to uh, enforce a, a zero COVID policy. People figured that uh, analysts, including myself, figured that once China finished with the with the covid policy then they would um they would come roaring back and that hasn't really happened so much now part of that may be that the chinese economy looks a little bit weaker if you're looking at it through the lens of something like uh oil prices because they're buying a lot of oil from russia uh outside of the uh outside of I guess, U.S. sanctioned um, payment systems. And so if you're just looking at oil consumption or oil prices, then maybe there's some argument to be made that uh, that not all the demand that is in China is, is necessarily showing up. I think that the, the crude oil futures would still sniff that out and reflect that probably. So I think the Chinese economy is probably a little weak, but... Um, like I said, pork prices remain relatively high. And so that's in part because it's taken a little longer to rebuild the industry in the way that they're, uh, the, the way that they want to do it. And so supplies have been a little bit tight. Um, that the, the, the pork supply part is something that can be sorted out in, in six weeks or six months or nine months, uh, probably if, if they really want to, and the economics are really there, um, you can have, uh, you can have two, uh, litters of, of pigs in, in nine months if the timing is right. And that can go a long way to restoring the, the hog numbers. And so, 
it may be that we start to see a pickup in in crush margins and import demand, but probably it won't be until the summer until we're in firmly in sort of South American uh, South American export season or the height of South American export season. So it, it doesn't seem likely that there's going to be a bunch of demand on on U.S. exports. And then next year, even if if China does, let's say that China imports 105 million tons of, of soybeans next year, I would bet that the, the bulk of those will come from uh, South America and that a, a declining share of, of China supply will come from the U.S. And they probably will. And I think South Africa is, is an attempt to do this. They'll probably develop as many more sources for um, soybeans as they possibly can. So China will opportuni opportunistically take soybeans from Argentina. Um, of course, they buy a lot from the U.S. And, and Brazil. It sounds like they probably will opportunistically take soybeans from South Africa now going forward as well. Those aren't big totals and they're not enough to, if, to completely cut the U.S. out of, of China supply chain. And, and China wouldn't do that anyway because they're particularly sensitive about uh, food security. So they like to develop multiple trading partners for each commodity, and uh, and the uh, the purchase from South Africa is is sort of a step in that direction of, of developing a new country. Although again, it doesn't necessarily provide a ton of help because they're another uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, country. So I say all that to say that I would expect that Chinese. Soybean import demand will pick up here over the next six months or so, but we probably won't see much impact from that in the U on U.S. shipments this year or or next year, unless La Nina comes back and we start to worry about uh, the weather conditions in South America again. It seems more likely that as South American production grows, which is always been the case if you line up uh, Chinese soybean usage against the growth in Brazilian acreage or production, those, those two correlate very, very well. And that relationship is probably going to continue, and the U.S. is probably going to see declining market share and, and potentially declining volumes. However, the one caveat to that that I would say is that if China's hog industry really comes back in a strong way, and next summer, they just still need a lot of, of soybean imports. Um, then they will they will buy from the U.S., but I just think we probably won't be one of their top two preferred suppliers. We may still remain number two in, in volume for a while. Um, but I think in terms of where they would prefer to buy soybeans, I, I don't think the U.S. is is one or two. I think uh, probably much more on the have to buy soybeans from us. So what does that mean for U.S. crush volumes? We're still at, at 2.3 billion bushels for our 23-24 our crush forecast. Um, you can see we got uh, October data for uh, crush uh, last month, this month, today, actually, we should get, or I think, it's, I, I assume it's today, um, we should get the fats and oils report that'll have November crush in it. November crush implied by um, implied by the NOPA data was record large, essentially, for, um, for the month. And uh, I think it might have been slightly smaller than uh, than October, but because it has one less day, if you look at it on a per day, it was actually above an implied record. I adjusted, or I guess I'm I'm in the middle of adjusting after looking at this a little bit more closely. Uh, our monthly crush forecast to line up more closely with um, with domestic meal demand, uh, which continues to remain strong. The NOPA data suggested that um, that meal usage in November was 110,000 tons, I think. I, I could be off a little bit on that one. Um, but, but 
not where we were a couple months ago when we were at 90,000 tons. Uh, the, the, the NOPA data implied roughly 110,000, give or take a couple thousand uh, tons per day of domestic soybean meal use, which was much more in line with last year's record months than it was uh, the, the couple of months where we had a, what looked like the beginning of a real slowdown. So as a result, I have shifted. Um, I've shifted the crush between the months to sort of balance the uh, the soybean meal exports. Um, however, the big drop from March to April doesn't look realistic. So I probably have a little bit more smoothing to do here. The big driver for record crush. Oil demand certainly contributes a lot to it, um, but that strength of oil demand is what really continues to drive the strength and crush. Once and and if we see a slowdown in in domestic meal demand, um, then it'll be very interesting to see what happens to soybean oil prices and crushing volumes. I would assume that if we saw a slowdown in meal demand today that there probably would be a bit of an adjustment period where um, where crushing volumes might not match up to oil demand. And so you could get a, a little spike in, in prices. If you see meal demand slow down, you could get a spike in, in oil prices. But again, it's probably not going to last for a really long time in part because, um, because of the South American crop and but in and when the crushers get everything then straightened back out, then I think there will be sufficient soybeans to meet the crush demand. So I, I'm not worried about whether we have enough soybeans to crush. Um, I would probably actually, depending on what today's data says, probably like to take my crush forecast up just a little bit. I don't think I don't it would probably be 25 million bushels just because that's kind of the minimum unit to to move the forecast by um but it would probably be a little bit less than that based on the nopa data now so it's not something that i'm i'm not sort of beating the table saying crush needs to go higher than 2.3 billion bushels but it does seem to be creeping towards uh a number that's a little bit higher than uh 2.3 billion and if if margins continue to remain at or above uh, the his, the long term average, then there's no reason to believe that uh, that crushing volumes couldn't be above two point three billion bushels. All right. Uh, on Friday, the last thing that I want to talk about here today on on Friday, uh, we also got the monthly EIA data. A uh, couple of quick points. I haven't had time to really, really dive into this too deeply yet, but a couple of quick points just from the uh, little glance that I took at it. Soybean oil remained about the same. It was just under 1.1 billion pounds, like 1.06. And we were just above that. We were like 1.09. Uh, so just a little above that. So in line with our expectation, I... This this year, I'd probably feel better about our, our forecast for uh, U.S. soybean oil consumption and biomass-based diesel, diesel production than I have for the last couple of years, for sure, because the numbers are coming in much closer to, to our expectations uh, before we would routinely be off by maybe a, 100 million pounds, we'd be larger, and now uh, things are starting to um, starting to even up a little bit, although we still are struggling to understand the tallow situation, um, in all honesty. EIA reported another, it was more than 500 million, I think. I can't remember whether it was 600 million or not, but another big month of, of tallow usage anyway, or another month that is roughly equal to the, um, to the supply of, of inedible tallow. Uh, so it seems like either we're using a lot more tallow than we actually have, or there's something that I'm missing in the numbers because um, they can work, but but it is awfully tight on on tallow. Um, speaking of low CI feedstocks, 
next week, what we're going to do, somebody had written in and asked me to do kind of the same thing for Yuko that I did for Tallow a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so next week's webinar, we'll take a, a deeper dive into Tallow. Uh, the last thing that I'll say on, on this, and then we'll, if there are any questions, we'll take those. Otherwise, we'll, we'll get out of here. Um, is that the split on soybean oil is a little bit different than it is for most of the other commodities. So for the, the growth that we've seen in tallow has almost entirely been on the renewable diesel side and, and renewable diesel consumes a lot more tallow than, um, than biodiesel does. For soybean oil, it's the exact opposite. I think that makes sense for a couple of reasons. One, traditionally, biodiesel was a bigger user of, of soybean oil than, uh, than renewable diesel. Uh, and two, I think more the, the increased availability of, of yuco and tallow from uh, the low, uh, from imports, uh, yuco from uh, China and, and tallow from Australia and, and New Zealand and everywhere in South America. Uh, and so I think the, the increased availability has allowed a little bit of, of a reduction in soybean oils portion of the total feedstock mix, even as the volumes continue uh, to grow or I guess continue might not be exactly right. They've reached a new plateau and they seem to be holding steady at that plateau, which is right around a billion, um, a billion pounds a month or, or one or right around 1.1 billion pounds a month. Um, on the, on the, the capacity data, the EIA reported a 150 roughly million gallon increase on renewable diesel and an increase on, on biodiesel but the increase on biodiesel just partially offset a, a decrease that they reported, I think, last month. And so biodiesel capacity remains about where it is or about where it has been for most of the last year, despite the fact that we saw a uh, dive in margins into the end of the year for biodiesel. Uh, it still looks like they are, are holding on. All right, with that, somebody has asked a question. Thank you for that. Uh, am I planning on adjusting the UCO price forecast down, seeing how it's been higher than the market prices? Yeah, so there are probably, yes. I, I haven't looked at the prices today. Um, it's one of the things we will do uh, when we right before we publish. And so we'll look at them either today or uh, or tomorrow. There are, uh, there are two parts to to sort of our forecast that I that I want to talk about. Um, one that we'll look at these and uh, and it's early in the month, so there's every reason to expect that if the market is is well below our forecast, that we'll adjust it um, lower. And and given where soybean oil prices are, I think that that probably just makes sense anyway. Um, the other is that uh, what we are are forecasting is the average price for the for the month. And so I don't know what today's forecast looks like. It may be that that we're ten cents above the um, the market. But in months where prices are really, really volatile, we can we can have forecasts that are that look like they're well above the market, but they're actually, just really close to the average for the month. And so when you look at the forecast, and, and I, I say that because somebody asked a, a very specific question. Um, when you look at the forecast, it's, it's good to remember a little bit that there are that we are predicting the monthly average and not necessarily the price going forward from where we are today. Um, that said, the pressure on on soybean oil or vegetable oil and and low CF feedstocks has been pretty significant uh, over the last couple of months from falling energy prices and now again if if you get soybean prices coming down that'll pressure soybean oil and eventually that'll pressure the low CI feedstocks as well. We are 
and Tallow kind of shows this, we are relatively close to using up the consumable supply of, of low CI feedstocks. And so even though my guess is that uh, just off the top of my head, what I would think is that the forecast probably should move lower for the next several months. And then you can move higher to add a little bit of, of weather premium in heading into the uh, heading into the U.S. growing season. Um, and then after that, you come back and you may uh, you may get more pressure on on prices. Again, depends on what the South American crop looks like and then what U.S. acreage is and, and what U.S. production looks like. Um, but assuming that we get trend line yields in South America and in the U.S., then I would expect that uh, that prices will move lower again um, as we head into the into the fall. And so it, it again, it probably would be uh, if I if I could just make up the forecast on my own and say this is 50 cents and this is 45 cents, it would probably go down for at least the next three months. Um, when we actually run it, it may look a little bit different in part because the um, the fundamentals for feedstock are, are so strong just on the demand side right now that the model wants to kind of raise the prices uh, a bit. Um, but again, I'll take a look at it and we probably will lower our price forecast. It just depends on, on what it looks like and it's, it's still relatively early in the month. Um, it appears that feedstock prices and RIN prices are correlated to soybean oil prices. Um, are, are as are diesel and biodiesel prices. Given these correlations, what are predictions for margins in 2024? We have, uh, and again, this is something that I'll, I'll revisit today, um, but we had margins coming back a bit in 2024. Now, I, th I think right at the end of last year, just before I went on break, I think margins came down, our, our predicted margins came down a bit um, for 2024. And mostly I'm thinking about uh, biodiesel. For renewable diesel, we predict margins that are about where they are now kind of going forward. Um, for biodiesel, I think that's the trickier of the, of the two uh, margins have been more volatile, uh, at least on for our our um, our chosen feedstock mix, mix, which is seventy five percent soybean oil, sixty five percent or twenty twenty five percent twenty five percent yellow grease. Um, so that the margins for that particular combination have been relatively volatile, and uh, we predict that margins for biodiesel will rise back up into the upper end of the historical range for uh, for a lot of 2024. However, I think that I could argue that that number is too high or, or too low. I tend to, to think that it's probably a bit too high. Um, because I think that uh, unless there's going to be some real inflation in energy prices, energy prices stay here or, or drift lower. If they drift lower, weakness in feedstock prices might offset the drift lower in energy prices. However, as you get into the summer and we start to add back a little bit of that weather risk premium, then I think it it will be more challenging to maintain margins, especially for biodiesel producers. As we roll from 2024 to 2025, that will be the really interesting period for margins because the migration from the blenders tax credit to the IRA credits looks like it at, at best if you use UCO and it, it all depends on the, the CI scores, but at best if you use UCO, it looks like you're maybe losing 40 cents a gallon. Um, I know that the IRS just published some new SAF uh, guidelines, but I don't think that they, I haven't looked at them yet, but I don't think that they impacted the uh, biodiesel or renewable diesel um, guidelines. So you take all of that revenue away and that's basically the, the profit margin for biodiesel producers. And if they, if they use soybean oil, the, the 60 cent credit is if they're using UCO. 
they're using soybean oil, it looks like on average, the credit is, is minimal 10 cents maybe. Um, and the IRA then of course, doesn't give credits to our uh, imports don't qualify for the IRA credits. So it, it, it seems likely given that scenario that the way that I think about it is you have sort of two choices. You can eliminate the use of soybean oil and you can eliminate U.S. imports. But if you do that, then you're not going to make the targets that the administration would like to make. Uh, and so if we really aren't going to change the IRA credit and that is where it is and we're going to leave the BTC expired, then biodiesel margins look awfully, awfully tough in, in 2025 in that scenario. The other scenario I would craft is the exact same scenario, except uh, RIN prices recover to offset the, the call it on average 60 cent decline in, in um, uh, revenue from the, the shift from the blender's tax credit to the Inflation Reduction Act credit. And so for 2024, it, it looks to me like I, I think a, a relatively fair bet would be margins kind of uh, renewable diesel about where it is and, and biodiesel margin positive, but not hugely positive. Uh, and then for 2025, like I said, I, I think uh, for both sides, we'll see tightening renewable diesel and biodiesel, both see a tightening of margins. Um, but biodiesel probably see more tightening of margins because they use more soybean oil, as as shown by the the EIA data recently. All right, good questions. Thank you for those questions. Always, always love to uh, answer your questions. All right, next week I'll be a little bit more with it and a little bit more on top of it, and uh, we will talk a lot about what's going on in UCO and the UCO fundamentals. Thanks for joining me. See everybody next week. Bye-bye.